Okay, so I've changed the title a little bit from the abstract just because I've thought more about it. Um, and this is more reflective of what I want to talk about. What I want to share with you today is some work that I've been doing for quite some time um, in a number of different studies in a number of different ways. Um, and I'm super excited about the opportunity to share with you because this is work that I feel really passionate about. Um, it feels important to me. Um, and I'm just very excited to share it with you all. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, throughout the talk today, um, I'm going to make the case that people who have privileged identities, um, and particularly people whose identities are in, privileged in high intersectionality ways, um, are critical in order to address inequity. Um, and that although they're well-meaning, um, almost all of them are well-meaning and don't like inequity and want to see it addressed. Um, they really are not well prepared in order to do this productively and without causing further harm. And I'm going to do this by sharing with you uh, the results from three different research studies that I've been involved with. Um, and before I forget um, the context of this, because I am going to gloss over it as I move on from here, um, the studies that I've done, it, it's all targeting higher education um, STEM and higher education with a particular emphasis on physics because that's my background. Um, physics is also an area in which we see um, a, a, the impacts of inequity pretty strongly. Um, and for the purposes of this, I'm focusing on race and gender. There are, of course, other identities um, that can be marginalized, um, but these are the two that I'm going to focus on here today. Um, and so because of that, when I'm talking about highly privileged people, I'm focusing on white men because that's who holds the, the privileged identities around race and gender. So within higher education institutions, they care quite a bit about equity, of course, um, and we see them doing actually a lot to try to address it. They acknowledge it. Um, they do a lot of things to address it. Here are some of the things that they do. Um, and this has been particularly true recently. We've in the last few years really seen even more attention, more acknowledgement, more efforts to address inequity in higher education. Um, so they, they care and there's a lot of effort that's being made. Okay, but we don't see a lot of progress being made. So here's data from physics. Um, so this is the, the number of basically non-Asian, non-white PhDs being awarded in physics. And you can see since 1998, it's not changing. We're not seeing a lot of progress. So first of all, it's incredibly low, right? We're talking about like 10% um, and the numbers aren't improving. And when we look for gender, um, it's, it's actually somewhat of a similar trend. Notice this goes back to 1968. The other one is 1998. Um, it does, there was an upper trend for a while, though it's not that upward. I mean, even at that upper trend, you're still looking at another 100 years until we reach equity, um, but it's also starting to fall off or, or remain the same. Um, so despite all of this effort and all of this attention and all of this care that's been given to these issues, we really aren't seeing change happen. We're not seeing impacts of it. The situation is somewhat obscured um, by looking at these two graphs um, that I just showed you. Um, and you can see it a little more clearly when you look at things from an intersectionality perspective. Um, so I have a, I have a little, um, I have a quiz for you, a little trivia. Um, if you would type your, if you know the answer to this, like you've heard it, don't type it in the chat, but if it's truly a guess for you, um, what year do you think the first black woman in the United States received a PhD in physics? And to give you a little context, the first black man there was 1876, first white woman was 1897. If you wanna make a guess, put it in the chat, if you're willing. Right, so the answer is 1972. Um, which some of you, some of you had like 2010. I don't know where that came, that came from. I guess you're even less optimistic than I am. Um, but 1972 was the year that the first black woman got a PhD in physics, which is really atrocious. Uh, the next question. 
How many PhDs were awarded at US universities to black women from 1972 when the first one was until 2017? And just to give you context there, there's about 60,000 total PhDs during that time. And again, if you make a guess, put it in the chat. All right, and the answer is 90. So that's 0.15% of all PhDs in physics. Um, this data, every time that I look at it, as much as I've seen it over the years, it still every time just like strikes me in this real visceral way of just how horrendous this is and what that implies about the field of physics. Um, so if you think about it, for example here, right, a white man is more likely to get a Nobel Prize in physics than a black woman is to get a PhD, right? That's the level of discrepancy that we see in this. Um, and it's something that you don't see if you go back here, these two graphs that I just showed you that can be obscure, obscured um, by looking at data because this, the data on minorities is mostly men, the data on the women is mostly white women that is in that graph. And so you're not seeing the true picture um, and how bad this is for some demographics. Okay, so the situation is bad, it's not getting better. And so we have to ask the question like, why is that, right? Why are we not, despite the fact that people care, they're putting a lot of effort into it, they're putting a lot of time, resources, money, research, right? A lot, a lot, a lot of effort and care is going into addressing this, and yet we're not seeing any kind of progress. And so you have to ask the question, why is that? Right? Why is it that we're doing all of this and we're not seeing change? And the only answer that's possible is that our change process is flawed, that the model that we're using for change is not an effective model. And so what is that model, right? So I, there are exceptions to this for sure, but if you delve into and you listen to what people are saying and what they're writing, um, for the most part, the model that's being used is one where the focus is on people who are marginalized. Right, so this is who's being talked about. This is where change efforts are being addressed. Um, so the onus of change is then placed on people who have very little power in the system, right? So as a woman in physics, I've gotten lots of messages of, you know, I need to build up my confidence. I need to negotiate for my salary. That's why I'm not paid the same, right? I need to somehow fit in and look and be able to be in this environment that's been created by men. Um, BIPOC folks feel the same, the same kind of messages on them. Um, what doesn't typically happen is that we look at who has power, how power is being used, how it's being implemented, and how we can change and shift that and what impact that has. Um, so who has power, right? So this is the chairs conference from a couple of years ago. Um, it's, it's a little bit blurry, but I think you guys get the idea that this is like almost all white men. I mean, there's a couple, couple of faces in there that aren't, but for the most part, these are the people who are setting policy. They have the most influence on culture. They have the most ability to influence things is white men. And so what I'm arguing is that a change strategy that would be better would be to focus on those people who actually have the power to do something and have the influence to have an impact um, and ask the questions. So that we're going to take these questions on as I go through my presentation here. I'm going to show you data to try and answer some of these questions. Um, how do those in power unintentionally support equity? Because most people who are in power actually don't want equity and equity to exist, right? They, they are supportive of, of change. Um, but even though they have good intentions, um, oftentimes they're actually not supporting it very well. And then what can we learn about how to dismantle this by studying their beliefs, their behaviors and values? So that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna show you some data um, from three different studies that I've been involved with. Um, this first study is one that I did with some folks, um, primarily at UNC Charlotte and then Katie Rainey, who was a grad student at Colorado, who worked with me. She is now Dr. Rainey and is doing very well. Um, her and I primarily worked on this project. Um, we had interviews with 183 seniors who were undergraduates majoring in STEM. Um, we 
we, we were diverse. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a representative sample, right? So we have lots of people of lots of demographics in there. Um, and one of the questions that we asked them in this interview is, is the experience of being a whatever their STEM major was, you know, of being a physics major different for people of different genders? And then we asked them the same question, is it different for people of different races? Um, so this is an interview study. We just asked this question as an open-ended question and let them answer it. Um, and then we categorized what their answers were. Um, so, you know, is the experience of being a STEM major different for people of different races and genders? Um, so what we find here is that, uh, you, you see a couple of things. So one is all demographics are more aware that gender has a rate or gender has an impact than that race has an impact. Um, so I, I listed the year there. This was, we actually collected this data in 2013. I suspect that we might see some improvement on this gap between race and gender just over the last couple of years. There's been a lot of attention to it. Um, my guess is the gender questions are still the same. Um, the other thing you see, of course, is that white men by and large don't see that race or gender has an impact, right? They're just oblivious to that. So of those who said it did have an impact, we looked at them to see what their impact was. This is a graph of those students who said that the impact was um, anything at all that had to do with difference in opportunities. Um, so again, we see for the white men, um, they, none of them, there were, these are about 30. So there's about 30 white men in this sample. None of them mentioned anything around race of race limiting or having differential opportunities. Um, and just a little more than 10% mentioned anything about gender having any impact on someone's opportunities, um, to be in the field and succeed, succeed in the field of STEM. Um, just because you're probably curious. Um, so if they said there was an impact, but they didn't list something that was like this sort of discrimination related, the other things they tended to say is, well, um, this person's not, you know, women just aren't as interested in engineering or someone of a particular race doesn't really have an interest in STEM. There's not a shred of evidence that that is true. In fact, exactly the opposite is what often comes up when we look at that. Um, the other thing that they said often is that the impact might be this, um, that people who are not white men might feel uncomfortable um, in the field. And I, I bring this up because we're going to come back to this. This word comfort here is going to come up over and over and over again today as I share this data with you. So when I first saw this data, I thought, wow, this is really interesting because if, if white guys just have this little understanding of what's happening with the people around them, what is that going to mean um, for the system and what is that going to mean for how the culture and the structures are going to be navigated. So the summary from this one, basically the white male undergraduate STEM majors have very little understanding of what's happening for the people around them. Um, and they also, for the most part, don't recognize that the opportunities to pursue and, and succeed in STEM are impacted by race and gender. They, you're just not aware of that. So these are undergraduates. So what happens if you look at faculty? Um, so this is study two. Um, this is a large study looking at physics, math, and chemistry faculty with all these wonderful colleagues that I have. We gave a survey um, looking at instructional practices to these faculty. Um, we got a lot of responses. And I'm not going to talk about that, but a subset of those on that survey, we asked them if who would be willing to do another survey, a second survey, um, looking at DEI issues. Um, and we had a little over a thousand faculty agree to take that second survey. And so the data that I'm going to show you now is from that survey of chemistry, math, and physics faculty. So here's one question we asked them. Um, have you ever experienced discrimination? in your field based upon your true or assumed gender. 
Um, so I want to say just a little bit about how we broke these categories down because we spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. And um, it, it's a little bit flawed, but it's the best that we could figure out to do. We broke people by gender into like privileged group, which is cis men and not privileged group. So someone who is a trans man is in the minoritized gender. Someone who listed themselves as a gender is in the minoritized gender. And then along race, we broke it down by privileged and um, represented or not represented. So within the field of uh, physics, math, and chemistry, white people are both privileged and represented. Um, people of certain Asian backgrounds are represented, but not privileged, right? They encounter a lot of the discrimination, harassment, negative impacts, um, even though they're represented. And then everybody else went in what this other race is, which is um, neither represented nor privileged. So that was how we broke those three categories down. Um, so what we find here with this is that not unsurprisingly, people who aren't of the privileged gender report um, quite frequently encountering discrimination in a professional setting. The same thing happened around race. So we asked the same question about race. And again, people who are not white report quite frequently experiencing discrimination professionally around their race. Okay, so then another question we asked them was, have you witnessed discriminatory behaviors? And if so, did you try to intervene? So a couple of things of note here. Um, so we know that it's happening a lot because people just reported it. That was the data that I just showed you. Um, this is how often they've recognized it. And again, just like the undergraduates, we see faculty, white male faculty are not noticing this. They're not seeing it at nearly the levels at which it's happening. So they're the least likely to notice it of all of these groups. Um, one kind of nice little point in here is that they are as likely to intervene once they do notice it roughly as what the other groups are. Their probability of trying to intervene is equivalent more or less across these groups. They just don't notice it, right? So they're gonna be less likely to have the opportunity to intervene if they don't notice it. So following up on that, we said, okay, the last time you noticed it and you tried to intervene. So these were the people who said that they wanted to intervene, what happened? Um, so what we see here is that nobody, no, no, no demographic in a majority was satisfied with the results, right? So the blue here is that I was satisfied with the results. And you can see that most of the time people are not, that they try to intervene and they don't feel like it actually results in something being addressed in a satisfactory manner. Um, and we asked them if they experienced negative consequences. So what we see is that no, for the most part, nobody feels satisfied when they speak up or very few people do, but the white men were the most likely to feel like their actions resulted in something positive. Um, they were also the least likely to report any kind of negative impact personally as a result of their attempts to intervene. So this to me is really, really important data because what this is indicating is that white men may very well have more power and influence and be listened to and be able to have an impact when they try to intervene and they face the less risk by doing so, right? And that's super, super important because that makes them, this is my argument that they are crucial for addressing inequity, right? They're the ones who are gonna be listened to and are more protected from the negative impacts compared to other groups. All right, so just to summarize um, that white men don't notice discrimination that other people experience. The institutional structures for addressing it often are not helpful and frequently result in negative consequences. Um, this is a nice book that goes into detail about just how horrendous this is um, if you're interested in higher education. Um, and then finally, white men are the least likely to experience negative consequences. So I wanna ask the question now, as we continue, um, what mechanisms do white men and white male institutions 
um, use to avoid knowing about and addressing these? Because what we're seeing here is a lot of ignorance around it and sort of how does that play out and how does that happen? And just to give you a framing for kind of how to look at this and how we're going to talk about it, there's this idea of epistemology of ignorance um, that sort of started with Charles Mills um, and has been taken up by other philosophers. And the idea behind this is that not knowing can be more than just simply a lack of having had the opportunity to know, right? And when it comes to issues of oppression privilege, like race and gender, it actually takes some effort to not know that these things are happening, right? To not be aware of what's happening around you um, is not just an accident, um, that it's embedded in power. And to sort of ask the question, right? How is knowledge made invisible? And how is that connected to power? Um, because it can take effort to not know these things. Um, and here's just a quote that I think explains this really well. Far from accidental, the ignorance of racially privileged often is deliberately cultivated, an act made easier by a vast array, and this is what's important, a vast array of institutional systems that support white people's obliviousness of the worlds of people of color. White ignorance includes both false belief and the absence of true belief of people of color. So I'm going to show you how this plays out um, specifically um, using data from specific individuals. All right, so here's the third study that I want to talk about. Um, so this is a study that I did with my um, colleague, Dr. Hadori, who's here on the Zoom. Um, we did interviews with 27 self-identified white male physicists from 13 different institutions. Um, we have a, about half faculty, half grad students. Um, the faculty were pretty prestigious dudes, right? They tended to be full professors. We got department chairs. They were in universities. We specifically targeted high PhD producing universities. So research intensive, like the premier kind of producing places that produce PhDs in the United States. Um, and we interviewed them about their knowledges, beliefs around gender and race. We had a pretty long protocol. Um, and I should say we didn't interview them because we wanted to make sure that they were comfortable expressing things. So we hired four white men to do the interviews for us. And then we did the analysis. Um, so I wanna say just a little bit because of the way that we got these, these folks, um, we, we, we kind of did it word of mouth a little bit. Like we sent notes to people and said, can you share this with relevant people um, and did a little bit of snowballing. And so there was no hidden agenda. They all knew what they were signing up for. And as a result of the way that we got our participants, the people who um, we interviewed were quite progressive in their um, beliefs. Like every single one of them was just like horrified that inequity would exist. Um, they all talked about ways that they cared about addressing it, that they were doing things to try to address it. They all see themselves as the good guys who mean well and are out there doing good things. They're very progressively minded. Um, and that's important to note as we go through the rest of um, what I'm going to show you, because despite their like saying, you know, I really believe in this and I really want to do something positive, um, almost all of them engage in, in some of them in, in, in really, really big ways and things that do far more to uphold white and male supremacy than do anything to undermine it. Um, and so I'm going to show you what some of those things are. See what, let me, I have a minute and let me see. Okay, I was just checking the chat for questions, but it looks like we're good for now. All right, so here are our findings. Um, I'm gonna go through each of these bullet points with data. Um, this first one, we found this in our interview data that they just, what I showed you already, um, which is that they just don't recognize what's happening around them for other people. Um, I'm not gonna show you data from this study, but we find the same thing that we did from the, the, um, the two studies that I've already shown you. Um, and then here are some other findings that I wanna go through and talk about here. 
Um, so this first one was a big one and we saw it a lot, a lot, a lot, um, which is that when they talk about racism, sexism, discrimination, they locate it as far away from themselves as they can. Um, and specifically they locate it in places over which they have no influence. Um, and what that ultimately does, right, is position them as being helpless to do anything about it. Um, so some examples here are that they'll, they'll, they physically locate it far away from themselves. So it's not me that's doing it. It's not my students, my department, not my university, not my field. Um, so here are some examples of this. Um, this person says, I don't see it where I'm done, right? This was a very common response. Um, this person, David, I've never encountered my students having these problematic student interactions that we were, were introducing in the, in the interview. Um, he says, because I say to students, um, I discuss these kinds of behaviors so they understand. There's no way to misunderstand the message. So perhaps in my classes, it doesn't happen because of that. So the data indicates, you know, just to reiterate that it's happening for Aki up here above, it is happening in his in his department. The data indicates that it's happening and it's probably fairly common. And the same thing here is true for David. They, by the way, people always ask me that we let them pick their own pseudonyms. So that's why some of them are a little weird. You'll notice as we go through. Um, here's another one. Um, he said, you know, that view is out there in society. You would be crazy to think it isn't inside some STEM fields. Attitudes among engineers are a lot different than among physicists. So he's reacting to data where we've shown him um, that discrimination exists within STEM and he discounts it by saying, well, that includes engineers too. So that's the problem, right? It's not physicists, it's engineers. So we see this a lot. This was a very, very common theme that came up. Another way that they locate it far away is they blame the K-12 system because these are all folks in higher education. Um, so here's David saying, oh, it's a societal thing about messages we pass on to women. Um, it's high school teachers that do it. I think the worst offenders are high school teachers in, gender, in general. So by locating it, like he's a, he's a professor of physics at a major research university. And by locating the problem with high school teachers, this is a way that he gets him off the hook from having to acknowledge that, well, it's happening actually inside your department in your classroom. Another one I like to do is just blame big social structures and SES stuff. Um, so black people are underrepresented because of economic backgrounds. Um, and if these groups of minorities are stuck in a less advantageous economic background, then you just don't consider them as much. This was a graduate student, right? So they, they like to locate this like far away in bigger structures. Um, you know, and also quite frankly, this is really ignorant because not all black people are poor and plenty of white people are poor, right? This is a, a wrong idea that we have, um, but he's buying into that and using that as a way of keeping it at a distance from himself. All right, so here's a question that we asked them or a set of questions that we asked them. Um, we showed them data, you know, actual data about um, the prevalence of reports of discrimination in STEM of both women and people of different racial groups. Um, and we asked them, it was just bar chart data. So we said, what experiences do you think these folks are thinking about when they report that they've experienced discrimination? And then we also asked them um, if they had ever witnessed discrimination in a professional setting. And if they said they had, we asked them, well, what did you do when you witnessed it? Um, so these two questions. So the most common answer, so we asked them, well, what are they, what are they thinking about when they report workplace discrimination? The most common answer that we got from these guys was something that could be explained as things people say that create discomfort. So here's some examples, people making snide and sensitive comments. Casual talk around the workplace might be what people refer to as locker room talk. Microaggressions, like being confused for the janitor. 
So this, these are answers that they gave after showing data about discrimination and saying, what were people thinking about when they reported discrimination? Then these are the kind of comments that they made in response to that question. And so the problem with that, just to, to clarify it here, that what they're talking about is harassment, right? All of these things, things that people say that make people uncomfortable, that's harassment, is not discrimination. And there's some big differences between harassment and discrimination. So harassment is, is, is held within a bad person. Like there's a bad person who is doing bad things. They're being a harasser um, as opposed to discrimination, but certainly can come from individual people, but more frequently is embedded in systems and culture. Um, the impact of harassment is generally that someone feels uncomfortable with something. The impact of discrimination is that someone has been denied an opportunity. Um, so harassment is bad, and certainly lots of harassment can lead to discrimination. If there is excessive amount of harassment, it can lead to impacting someone's opportunity. Um, but these are different things, and discrimination is on a much, much higher level. Um, it's stemming from a source that's much more insidious, um, and the impact is much worse than it is for harassment. Half of our faculty that we interviewed when we specifically asked for incidences of discrimination could only think of things that were actually harassment. Didn't say anything that would qualify as discrimination at all. Um, and sometimes they would even say like, well, I don't know, what do you mean? Do you mean discrimination with a big D, right? I mean, discrimination is a legal term, it's defined, you know, it's not subjective. Um, but that's not how they're thinking about things. They're thinking about things on this lower level. Um, so I go back to our findings. So we've hit the next two there. Um, so now I wanna talk about the last three claims that I'm making here. So another thing we see them doing is sugarcoating, minimizing what's happening. So here's an example talking about sexism and physics. Paul says, I think everyone's had at least one negative story. Like he doesn't even call it discrimination. He just calls it a negative story, whether it affected them negatively or not. I mean, the story's negative. Whether it affected them negatively is less clear because these are all people that have been successful. So he's talking about his female colleagues who have had negative stories, but they've all been successful. So it's not, it's not clear that it's that bad is sort of what he's saying. Here's another example from Picard. Um, when he was asked about advice, he would give students. Um, and he says, well, my department's male dominated. It's basically made up of white men. Who you're gonna be interacting with is mostly white men. You'll be accepted, you'll be welcomed, you'll be valued. No one will think for a second that you're less in any way, but be aware of the ways that people interact socially may not be the most comfy for you, right? So here's this comfortable idea again, right? And I, I forgot to highlight it again when I was talking about the harassment versus discrimination, right? When asked for incidences of discrimination, they tended to talk about things that made people uncomfortable, right? So they're in, they're in the domain of comfort is a lot of sort of how they're thinking about things. So what happens when they do notice the discrimination? Um, how do they tend to intervene? So remember, we asked them if they had witnessed anything. If they did, we followed up with, well, what did you do? Most common answer is that they don't intervene. Um, so here's an example, I didn't engage. I'm not brave enough to tell a more senior person that comment was over the line. Um, here's another example, I'm not great about stepping into that conversation and being productive. I don't feel like I have the tools to handle this productively. So this was really common. Either I was afraid of negative consequences. I didn't know what to do. Um, these are very, very common reasons for why, yes, I saw it, but I didn't do anything. I didn't try to do anything. I'm gonna take a minute, oops. I was going to take a minute and read the chat. Uh, 
Um, so Nicole, I see you have a question, but it's complex and it required me to think about it for a minute. I'll come back to that one. Okay, actually, I'm going to come back to all of these that are here in a bit. The other thing that we see is that when they do try to intervene, um, that we it, it often isn't in a way that would be likely to either repair the harm to the target or to disrupt future discrimination. And let me give you some examples of this. <clears throat> so this is someone and he's saying, I've seen nasty stuff among my students around race. And I thought I need to work to make my class more inclusive. I explicitly acknowledge we have people of different perspectives and different backgrounds. I let my students know if I'm not making this class comfortable for you, if I'm in any way making it feel exclusionary, let me know about that. So, you know, in some ways this is good. He's acknowledging that it's happening. And he has this idea that he should do something. Um, but I highly doubt that telling the students, hey, we have people of different perspectives here is actually addressing what's happening between the students. So we know, for example, that, um, you know, when it's like a gender dynamic, you know, that men tend to interrupt, talk over, not allow women to um, voice their opinions or question them more. We also see those same things around racial lines. Um, you know, we also see, for example, sometimes people won't work with, you know, white men might not work with people of other genders or races, and they can be really isolated um, in the classrooms. And this thing can be massively impactful to the people who are the targets of that behavior. Um, standing up and saying, hey, in my class, I want this to be inclusive doesn't address those dynamics. Here's another example. Um, so he was, the, AJ was talking about how he understands that letters of recommendation might be more critical for women. And he's saying, um, I weigh those comments differently or try to, I'm department chair. So anytime we have a search, we focus on this for a while. So again, this is good. It's definitely a first step. Um, you know, he's acknowledging it, you know, saying, hey, we're going to account for that in the hiring process. Um, but notice what he's not doing. He's not doing any work with his own faculty to make sure they're not perpetuating this by writing their own letters. Um, he's not calling out any of the letter writers. Like, so if he gets a letter and says, oh, this is really biased, he just lets it go. He doesn't call it out or question it in any way, right? So there's not anything happening that would be likely to decrease the amount of this happening going forward. It's just sort of like a Band-Aid dealing with whatever's happened rather than disrupting it at the source. Um, so the, the last thing that I want to share with you is this idea that we see with them of sort of like um, taking responsibility for their knowing or understanding and like putting it on somebody else. So here's an example. Um, me, th so AJ was asked about, you know, as a person, as an instructor, what he would do if he saw some dynamics happening in his classroom. Um, and he says, I don't know what I do. I might refer the person who was being targeted by the behavior to someone else. Our university has lots of support staff for students. There's lots out there. I might actually refer them to someone who's a little bit more professional. I'm not a very good therapist, really. So there's a lot in this quote to unpack. Um, in addition to the point that I'm trying to make here, which is that, you know, this is his class, his students, he's in charge, he's the professor, he's the one for, who's responsible for making sure that that learning environment is safe and open to everyone. And he's basically saying, I don't know what I do, I would like, let somebody else, you know, figure that out, how to handle things in my own classroom, even though I'm the one that's there when it's happening. Um, but you can also see here the way that he's like not you know, I'll get help for the person who's the target rather than getting help addressing the, the people that are creating the environment that's problematic. Okay, so here's another example of how that showed up. Um, Jonah here was asked if sexism exists in his department. He's like, I don't know, you'd have to ask the women. Right. I mean, this is someone who has a, a gender, he has a race, he's been in this field for 30 something years and can't answer the question of 
how does, you know, gender have an impact, you know, it feels like, well, I need women to tell me this. Um, and so just in, in light, I, I just want to make a comment here, you know, they, where they're saying these things, but they're also not, and so there is a way in which, right, as a white person, there, there are certain things that are really hard for me to understand, and I, I do need people of color to help me to learn some of those things, but they're also not taking the responsibility to go to say, I don't know this, I'm teaching a class, I need to go learn it. Um, so for example, when I go, I go to a lot of workshops um, dealing with um, DEI issues. Um, and it's honestly, it's really rare to see sort of a cis white man there. Most of the people who show up for those things are people who in some fashion are experiencing these things. Um, I don't see the people who are on the privileged end of it generally showing up. Um, so these are the findings that I just went through. Um, these are the ones that I just showed you. So when I ask the question, what happens when the most influential people aren't able to know that these things are happening and don't know how to act around it? And I argue that this is what happens, right? Is that we don't see change, that we see um, some groups not having the same opportunities to be and succeed as others, and we don't see improvement around that. So I wanna conclude and then um, give some suggestions for going forward. Um, we have a system that encourages people who have privilege to do all of these things that I just identified, plus a lot more. I mean, I could go, I could do this talk for another probably four hours, just of all kinds of these kind of moves that we see. There's also a lot that's been identified in the literature of, you know, sort of moves that progressives make um, in order who are in privileged positions to not deal with the privilege that they have. And it's a system that encourages this, right? So we live in a system, we have a culture and we have structures that make it easy to fall into all of these patterns. So what are the implications of this? So I have two slides, one for individuals, one for institutions. Um, for privileged people, you know, the first thing is that don't take what I've said here and then recenter your own privilege by making it all about you. Basically, um, it is uncomfortable, it is difficult, it takes a lot of work, it can be really difficult work. You have to find a way to put that aside so that you can do the work. And this is just a quote that I've, I've always enjoyed um, by Beverly Tatum. She, she talks about it really well. Cultural racism is like smog in the air. Sometimes it's so thick it's visible, other times it's less apparent but always day in and day out, we're breathing it. If we live in a smoggy place, how can we avoid breathing in the air? Prejudice is an integral part of our socialization and it's not our fault, but this does not relieve us from responsibility. We may not have polluted the air, but we need to take responsibility along with others for cleaning it up. All right, so don't take it personally, right? It's all, I mean, as a white person, right? I've struggled with all of these myself and I still do. I am still learning and still screwing up all the time right? It's not our fault. It's sort of the system that we're in and that we're embedded in, but you do have the responsibility to acknowledge that and learn how to do better. Um, and so the answer is to learn, right? To do what you can to learn. Listen to podcasts, read books, journal articles, go to those workshops, join affinity groups, um, and also importantly, form genuine relationships with people um, who are different from you. Um, so I guess we know with BIPOC folks or with any other folks from marginalized identities, not as a way of having them teach you, but as a way of being able to see and share their experiences in the world and learning through that. All right, so what about institutions? Um, you know, for institutions, it's to shift the burden of change from people who are marginalized to people who are privileged, because right now the onus, as I mentioned, is generally on marginalized people to be more like privileged people to be successful. Um, so engage in more research, like the research that I've shared with you. Make the focus of change systems that support privilege. 
change system to reward favoring knowing over ignorance. Um, so right now you can become, so in physics, for example, because I've seen it all the time, you can get your PhD, get a job at a really prestigious university, become the chair of that university, win lots of prizes and acknowledgements, and never demonstrate any understanding at all of issues around DEI. Like it's not needed to be highly successful in the field. And as long as that continues, we're going to have people who are highly successful and have no, demonstrate no understanding of that. Value equity work, right? So right now it's often like an add-on that people are expected to do, particularly women and people of color as sort of service. Um, and then ensure that the mechanisms are in place for dis the addressing the discrimination when it occurs. So we see in the data that people are willing to bring things up and say, hey, this is happening, but the system normally responds by not addressing it and frequently punishing the person that brought that up. All right, so those are, um, those are the ends of my slides. And I think we have maybe 10 minutes for questions. Uh, if you have any question, please, uh, you can unmute and ask directly. Uh, that's also uh, permitted. Thank you. I just want to give you a round of applause. That was amazing. Oh. Thank you so much. That was great. And I know there are questions in the chat, but I'm having a hard time like reading and thinking about them and answering them. So if you guys want to just kind of bring them up, that would be better. I'll I'll uh, I'll voice it. Um, so in my department, uh, there's skepticism toward a lot of the DEI initiatives, and this is one of the things that's sort of being mentioned um, in the chat here, which is. Uh, we're, we're kind of split politically and uh, a lot of the people who are on uh, one side or the other of that divide uh, approach any initiative which is intended to reduce inequity as being uh, suspect in both its causes and its effect. What do you do about trying to overcome that in particular when there's when people are uh, are attaching positions like this to their identity? How do you overcome a little bit of that defensiveness? Your question feels to me a bit too big for me to try to tackle. I think um, because it's it's just there's so much there. I think if I heard it right, you're saying that when DEI initiatives come up, that there are people who feel defensive around it. Yeah, and they... they, they they, they think of them as uh, intrusive, not very useful, possibly even counterproductive. I should be clear that I'm not among those people, but this is uh, this is the the obstacle I would like to um, to to do something about. Yeah, I mean, my answer to that, I think, is two pieces. One is that sometimes I feel that way, too, because some of these initiatives are don't feel genuinely helpful because they're not targeting like this sort of the case I was making, they're not targeting the structures and they're not mm -hmm. targeting the people who have power. Um, like sometimes they, they feel like they're making an effort, but they don't wanna do it in a way that actually calls it all out for what it really is. Um, and so that's one piece. You know, the other piece is, um, you know, the university is very good about other things about saying, get over it, you need to do this. Um, and, you know, having a culture that says this is a value. So this was sort of what I was saying on the last slide. Um, this is a value we have, this matters. Everyone here should have the opportunity to succeed. Um, and just saying you, you can't, you know, we're not, we're not going to, we're not going to allow people to say, oh, this is uncomfortable or whatever around that um, and reward, make sure that the reward structures reflect that. I, it's hard for me to give a more specific um, answer because your question is not that specific. Um, so I'm struggling a little bit with sort of more practical, a more practical answer to that. I could give you a specific example, but I don't want to take up too much time if other people have questions that they want to bring up. Why don't we come, we'll come back to you in a little bit. How's that? Sure. Okay. Yes, I, I have a question. Um, I actually have two related questions. 
And that is that the response that you sometimes get to the data of the, the data you presented early on is that the self-report is, uh, I think people assume that the self-report is sullied by whining, right? So the, these are, yes, I've experienced discrimination, but people say it's not really discrimination. You're just whining. And um, in relation to that, I think also that efforts to reduce inequity sometimes look to people like granting unfair privileges. And I just, I don't know how to respond to either of those. Are you asking me how to respond? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a ton of data out there that indicates that this is not the case. I mean, I'm sure that some people maybe do that, but that it's super, super rare. Um, and that most of the time when people say this, there's like large amounts of data that indicate that this is happening. You know, so everything from, you know, for example, data looking at like hiring where they've sent out identical resumes, right? And, you know, the, the guy with the white guy sounding name is gonna do better than anybody else. Um, or student evaluations, you know, of their professors are very different for people of different demographics. Um, you know, and I, I, what I would say is I go back to that there needs to be at the highest levels, a culture and structures that support that being acknowledged and not discounted, right? That says, no, you know, we're not, you know, these things are not supported by data. Um, and so we're not going to kind of delve into that and allow that kind of thing to be what the speech pattern is here. If that makes sense. Yeah. Thank and you. right now it is. I mean, I see, I see people all the time say this stuff and they get all kinds of attention for it instead of just being told, no, you're, you know, you're full of them and you need to stop. Um, I see, I see a few hands. So Sarah is the first hand I see. Hi, yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for this. It's been really wonderful. Um, I'm thinking of how you were talking about the excuses we have for not seeing or not intervening when things happen. Um, and you mentioned that some people say they don't have the tools or they don't feel like it's something they're good at. Um, do you have any recommendations or know of any resources that help people with like that training in like a hands-on kind of way? I feel like a lot of the things I go to are more like webinars or seminars, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and if we did want to bring that in for people to like, have models. Um, do you know of any? Um, yeah, I wish that I had some really good answer for you. Um, I think there are probably some out there um, and I'll see what I can dig up around it. Um, but I, I agree with you. I think it is, it is hard sometimes to know. I mean, I feel this oftentimes as someone who's white, some of the things that I navigate, I feel like, oh, I just don't know what to do here. Um, and then, you know, sometimes when I hear the answer, it seems really obvious. Um, so like, for example, and I, I just didn't have time um, today to include it, but one of the things that we, one of the questions that we asked was, um, we gave them um, a, a description of, of a classroom where a black woman, everywhere she would sit, people would move away from her and then she would move to them and then they would move away again um, because, People didn't sit next to her, which is a very common experience that Black women have in institutions of higher education, um, and probably lower than that as well. Um, and we asked our participants, what would you do if this happened in your classroom? So some of the quotes were actually in relation to that story. And most of what they said was, well, I would just, I mean, so some of them were like, I don't know. And then some said, well, I would just assign groups or I would assign seats so that, you know, they had to sit down next to her. Um, and that's great, um, except it doesn't, again, it doesn't get at the underlying dynamic of what's happening. So she'll be sitting with these folks, but we know from other data that they're going to be hostile to her and not supportive. And she's not going to have a very good experience, even if they are forced to sit next to her. Um, so the same researcher that told that story went in in a later publication um, and studied highly successful physics departments at bringing about diversity. And there's one that she reported on. And, you know, what they did around it was they have a culture of training students 
about proper behavior and how to interact with other students. And when they see students violating that, they have a culture of calling it out in class and actually saying something like actually saying like, hey, you, I see you, you're not like letting other people speak. You're not listening to other people, you're doing this and actually talking to the students and addressing that directly. Um, and so those kind of things can be very helpful. I do agree with you. I think those, I think it's hard to find those resources um, and hard to know that, but it's, it's there, it's there. And it's also there if you, you know, the other thing you can do when you come on these things is problem solve it. So this is what I do when something comes up and I have an experience and I'm like, oh, what do I do? I find someone who I think might have some insight and I talk it out with them. And then, then at least the next time I'm a little more positioned to be able to manage that and figure out what to do around it. Um, Anne, I see your hand up. Thank you, and, and thank you for this talk. It's really, really helpful. So you've answered this question in part, but if there's more you can say, I'd be grateful. Um, when this is about reward for knowing, stepping up to know, as opposed to the pattern of not knowing. So when you have a well-intended and highly effective leader who is still not knowing, what does it look like when you talk about reward for knowing? and and what does that, how does that translate into functional solutions? So what does it look like to have a reward for knowing, I think is your question? Yeah, it's two parts, yeah. And then part two is how does that, um, sorry, my Zoom's going off. Um, how does that translate into to functional solutions to discrimination? And maybe you can't answer both those questions at the same time, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a hug. You could talk for hours answering your question. Um, you know, so like some, some specific examples that come to mind, for example, you know, faculty can get tenure without ever demonstrating that they have any understanding of what's happening for the colleagues around them. Right, they can get tenure without ever attending a workshop. They can get tenure while they have some of these really outrageously ignorant views. Um, there's nothing in place that says, hey, you need to demonstrate. Uh, and we have ways of demonstrating research competencies. We have ways of demonstrating teaching. We have ways of demonstrating service. Right? We have ways of demonstrating other things, but we don't have a lot of ways of demonstrating that. It, it is coming. It is coming. I guess I'm, I'm somewhat, you know, it's coming in a way that to me feels very immature at this point, like write a diversity statement, um, which is not particularly sufficient to do that, um, but at least that idea is coming. Um, and there was something else you said that I was going to say, but now it lost my, my thought. What was the second part of your question? What do functional solutions look like to discrimination once the knowing oh. is it Right. So the other piece of this is that, you know, to me, one of the biggest pieces, and I, I showed you some data on that. Um, so the, the data from the EEOC um, indicates that, I was just looking at this morning, I think it's 63% of all people who file a discrimination complaint with the EEOC end up leaving their job, right? That's the most common outcome of trying to bring attention to discrimination, um, which is not how it should be, right? And, and I showed you this with the data that we showed here that our folks who tried to intervene almost never felt like it resulted in the discrimination being satisfactorily addressed and they often were punished for their effort of trying. And that has to, that absolutely has to change, right? There needs to be a culture where it is welcome and it is safe for people when they say, hey, this doesn't seem right, like I don't think what's happening here is okay for them to bring that up and not be, have the system very, very strongly smack them back down and make that something that they, is a personal cost to them. And then, you know, nothing happens anyway. I mean, in my experience with higher education institutions, and this is not a knock on any particular one, is that they're terrible at doing that that it is not actually a welcome process. The processes are set up to protect the institution, right? They're set up to protect the institution from being sued and not to actually address and use these reporting mechanisms in order to figure out like, oh, we've got some stuff happening here. We really should address. People are willing to give voice to it and say, this is what's happening, but the institution doesn't respond to that in any way other than to try to make it go away and protect themselves. 
And so working on that, those processes and that system is clearly a one big ripe avenue for progress. Thank so you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dancy. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, this uh, presentation is over an hour uh, to present because the topic is quite interesting. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. We look forward for our next semester uh, cafe, which is coming up in uh, the next section. So we'll send the recording to each one of you. Thank you for joining us today. Have a good day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.